This lecture is a continued discussion of discriminative classifiers for text categorization. So in this lecture, we're going to introduce uh, yet another discriminative classifier called a support vector machine, or SVM, which is a very popular uh, classification method and that has been also shown to be effective to, for text categorization. So to introduce this uh, classifier, let's also think about the simple case of two categories. And we have two uh, topic categories, theta1 and theta2 here. And we want to classify documents into uh, these two categories. And we're going to represent, again, a document by a feature vector x here. Now, the idea of this uh, classifier is to design also a linear separator here that you see. And it's very similar to what you have seen in logistical regression. Right? And we're going to also say that uh, if the sign of this function value is positive, then we're going to say the object is in category 1. Otherwise, we're going to say it's in uh, category 2. So that makes uh, zero value the decision boundary between the two categories. So in general, in high dimensional space, uh, such a zero um, point corresponds to a hyperplane. Now, I've shown you a, a simple case of two dimensional space with just x1 and x2. Now, in this case, uh, this corresponds to a line that you uh, can see here. Right? So this is um, a line defined by uh, just uh, uh, three parameters here, beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2. Now this line um, is heading in this direction, so it shows that as we increase x1, uh, x2 will also increase. So we know that um, beta 1 and beta 2 have different signs. One is negative and the other is positive. Right? So let's just assume that uh, beta 1 is negative and beta 2 is positive. Now, it's interesting to uh, examine then the data instances on the two sides of this line. So here, the data instances are visualized as circles for one class and diamonds uh, for the other class. Now, one question is to take a point like this one and to ask the question, what's the value of this expression or this classifier for this data point? So what do you think? Basically, we're going to evaluate its value by using this, uh, this function. And as we said, if uh, this value is positive, we're going to say this is in category 1. And if it's negative, it's going to be in category uh, 2. Intuitively, this line separates these two categories. So we expect the, the points on one side would be positive and the points on the other side would be negative. Now, the question is under the assumption that I just mentioned, uh, let's examine a particular point like this one. So what do you think is the sign of this uh, expression? Well, um, to examine the sign, we can uh, simply look at this, uh, this expression here. And we can compare this with, let's say, a uh, value on the, the line. Let's say, compare this with this point. Right? They have identical x1, but then one has a higher value for x2. Now. Let's look at the sign of the coefficient for uh, x2. Well, we know this is a positive. So what that means is that the f value for this point should be higher than the f value for this point on the line. That means this will be positive, right? So we know in general, uh, for all the points on this side, uh, the function's value would be positive. And you can also verify all the points on this side would be negative. And so this is how this kind of linear classifier or linear separator can then separate the, the points in the two categories. So now the natural question is which linear separator is the best? Now I uh, again show one line here that can separate the two classes. And this line of course is determined by the vector beta, the coefficients. Different coefficients will give us a different line. So we could imagine there are other lines that can do the same job. So gamma, for example, uh, could give us another line that can also separate these, um, these instances. Uh, 
And of course, there are also lines that won't separate them, and those are bad lines. But the question is, when we have multiple lines that can separate both classes, uh, which line is the best? In fact, you can imagine there are many different ways of uh, choosing the line. So uh, the logistical regression classifier that you have seen earlier uh, actually uses some criteria to determine where this line should be. And it's a linear separator as well and uses a conditional likelihood on the training data to determine which line is the best. But in SVM, we're going to look at another criteria for determining which line is the best. And this time, the criteria is more tied to the classification error, uh, as you will see. So the basic idea is to choose the separator uh, to maximize the margin. So what is the margin? Well, I choose, um, so I, I've shown some uh, dotted lines here to indicate the boundaries of those data points in, um, uh, uh, in each class. And the margin is simply the distance uh, between the line, the separator, and the closest point from each class. So you can see the margin on this side is as I've uh, shown here. And you can also define the margin on the other side. And in order for the separate to maximize the margin, it has to be kind of in the middle of the, the two boundaries. And you don't want this separate to be very close to one side. And that, that intuitively, intuitively makes a lot of sense. So it, this is the basic idea of SVM. We're going to choose a linear separator to maximize the margin. Now, on this slide, I've also changed the notation so that I'm not going to use beta to denote the parameters, and, but instead I'm going to use w, although w uh, was used to denote the words before, so don't be confused here. w here is actually a weight, um, a weight, a set of weights. And so uh, I'm also using uh, lowercase b to denote the beta zero, the bias constant. And the data instance is still represented as x. And I also use the vector form of um, multiplication here. So we see transpose of w vector multiplied by the feature vector. So b is a bias constant, and w is a set of weights. And with one weight for each feature, we have m features. And so we have m weights, and they're represented as a vector. And similarly, the data instance here, the text object is represented uh, by also a feature vector of the same number of elements. Xi is a feature value. And for example, word count. Right? And, and you can verify when we uh, multiply these two vectors together, take the um, dot product, we get the same um, form of the linear separator as you have seen before. It's just a different way of representing this. Now I use this way so that it's more consistent with what notations people usually use when they talk about SVM. This way you can better connect the slides with some other readings you might do. Okay, so um, when we maximize the margins of um, a separator, it just means we, the boundary or the separator is only determined by a few data points. And these are the data points that we call uh, support vectors. So here I illustrated uh, two support vectors for one class and two for the other class. Right? And these supporters define the margin, basically. And you can imagine once we know which are support vectors, then this, uh, this center separate line will be determined by them. So uh, the other data points actually don't really matter that much. And you can see um, if the, you change other data points, it won't really affect the margin. So the separator will stay the same. It's mainly affected by the support vector machines. Sorry, it's mainly affected by the support vectors. And that's why this is called a support vector machine. OK, uh, so now the next question is, of course, how can we uh, set it up um, to optimize the, the line? How can we actually find the line? Or the separator. Now this is equivalent to finding values for W and B because they would determine where exactly this separator is. So in the simplest case the linear SVM uh, is just a simple optimization problem 
So again, we let's recall that our classifier is such a linear separator where we have weights for all the features and the main goal is to learn these weights W and B and the classifier will say X is in category um, theta 1 if it's positive otherwise it's going to say it's in the other category right? so this is our assumption, our setup so in the linear SVM we are going to then seek uh, these uh, parameter values to optimize the, the margins and then the training error the training data would be basically like in other classifiers we have a set of training points where we know the x vector and then we also know the corresponding label yi and here we define yi as uh, two values but these two values are not 0 1 as you have seen before but rather negative 1 and a positive 1 and they're corresponding to these two categories as I've shown here now you might wonder why uh, we don't define them um, as 0 and 1 but instead of having negative 1 and 1 and this is purely for mathematical convenience as you will see in a moment so the goal of optimization first is to uh, make sure the labeling of training data uh, is all correct so that just means if yi the known label for uh, instance xi is 1 we would like this classified value to be uh, large and here we just choose a threshold of 1 here uh, but if you use another threshold you can see you can easily affect that uh, constant into the parameter values b and w to make the right hand side uh, just 1 now if on the other hand yi is negative 1 that means it's in a different class then we want this uh, classifier to give us a very small value in fact a negative value and we want this value to be uh, less than or equal to negative 1 now uh, these are the two different uh, instances uh, different kinds of cases uh, how can we uh, combine them together now this is where it's convenient when we have chosen yi uh, as negative 1 for the other category because it turns out that we can easily combine the two into one constraint yi multiplied by the classified value must be larger than or equal to 1 and obviously when yi is just 1 you see this is the same as the constraint on the left hand side but when yi is negative 1 you also see uh, you know, this is equivalent to uh, the other uh, inequality so this one actually captures both constraints in a unified way and that's uh, a convenient way of capturing these constraints What's our second goal? Well, that's to maximize the margin, right? So we want to ensure the separator uh, can do well on the training data. But then among all the cases where we can separate the data, we also would like to choose the separator uh, that has the largest margin. Now, um, the margin can be shown to be related to the magnitude of the weight. And so um, W transform multiplied by W would give us basically um, the sum of squares of all those weights right so this to to have a small value for this expression it means all the um, the wi's must be uh, small so we've just assumed that we have a constraint that for the uh, getting the data on the training set to be classified correctly now we also have an objective that's tied to maximization of margin and this is simply to maximize, oh, sorry, to minimize uh, W transpose multiplied by W. And we often denote this by phi of W. So now you can see this is basically an optimization problem, right? Uh, we have some variables uh, to optimize, and these are the weights and, and B. And we have some constraints. These are linear constraints. And the object of the function is a quadratic function of the weights. So this is a quadratic program with linear constraints and there are standard algorithms that are available for, for solving this problem. And once we solve the problem, we'll obtain the weights W and B and then this would give us a well-defined classifier. So we can then uh, use this classifier to classify any new textual objects. Now, the previous formulation did not allow any error in the classification but sometimes the data may not be linearly separable that means they may not uh, look as nice as you have seen on the previous slide where a line can separate all of them and what would happen if we allow some errors well the principle can stay 
right? So we want to minimize the training error, but uh, try to also maximize the margin. But in this case, we have a soft margin because the data points may not be completely separable. So it turns out that we can easily modify the SVM um, to accommodate this. So what you see here is very similar to what you have seen before, but we have introduced the extra variables, CI, and we in fact will have one for each data instance. And this is going to model the error that we allow for uh, each instance. But the optimization problem will be very similar. Right? Um, so specifically, you will see we have added something to the optimization problem. Uh, first, we have added uh, some um, some uh, error uh, to the constraint so that now we allow uh, allow the uh, classifier to make some mistakes here. So this CI is uh, the allowed uh, error. If we set CI to zero, then we go back to the original constraint. We want every instance to be classified accurately. But if we allow this to be, uh, be non-zero, then we allow some errors here. In fact, when CI is very large, the error can be very, very large. So naturally, we don't want this to happen. So we want to then also minimize this CI. So uh, CI needs to be minimized in order to control the error. And so as a result, in the objective function, we also add more to the original one, which is only W and by uh, basically ensuring that we're going to not only minimize the weights, but also minimize uh, the errors, as you see here. Here we simply take a sum over all the instances. Each one has a CI to um, model the error allowed for that instance. And when we combine them together, uh, we basically uh, want to minimize the errors on all of them. Now you see there's a parameter C here, and that's a constant to control the trade-off between minimizing the errors and maximizing the region, or the, the margin. If C is set to zero, you can see, uh, we go back to the original uh, objective function where we only maximize the margin, and we don't uh, really optimize the training errors. And then CI can be set to a very large value to make the constraints easily satisfied. That's not very good, of course. So C uh, should be set to a non-zero value, a, a positive uh, value. But when C is set to a very, very large value, we'll see the objective function will be dominated mostly by the training errors. And so the optimization of margin will then play a secondary role. So if that happens, what would happen, what would uh, happen is uh, then we will try to do our best to minimize the training errors, but then we're not going to uh, take care of the margin. And that affects the generalization capacity of the classifier for future data. So it's also not good. So uh, empirically, this parameter C has to be actually set um, carefully. And uh, this is just like in the case of k nearest neighbor, where you need to optimize the number of neighbors. Here you need to optimize the C. And this is in general also uh, achievable by doing cross-validation. Basically, you look at the empirical data uh, to see uh, what value C should be set to, to in order to optimize the performance. Now, with this modification, the problem is still a quadratic program with linear constraints. So the optimization algorithm can be actually applied to solve this, this uh, different uh, version of the, the program. Again, once we have obtained the weights and uh, the bias, then we can have a uh, classifier that's ready for classifying new objects. So that's the basic idea of SVN. So to summarize the text categorization methods, uh, we have introduced many methods, and some are generative uh, models, some are discriminative methods, and these uh, tend to perform similarly when optimized. So there's still no clear winner, uh, although each one has its pros and cons, and the performance might also vary um, on different data sets for different problems. And, um, one reason is also because uh, the feature representation is very critical. And, and so uh, these methods all require effective feature representation. And to design an effective feature set, we need a domain knowledge. 
and humans definitely play an important role here. Although there are new machine learning methods uh, like representation learning that can help uh, with uh, learning uh, features. And another uh, common thing is that uh, they um, might be, uh, be performing similarly on uh, the uh, data set, but uh, with different mistakes. And so they, their performance might be similar, but then the mistakes they make might be different. So that means it's useful to uh, compare different methods for a particular problem and then maybe uh, combine multiple uh, methods because this can uh, improve the robustness and they want to make, make, make the same, same mistakes. So uh, ensemble approaches that would uh, combine different methods um, tend to be more robust and can be useful in practice. Uh, most techniques that we introduced uh, use supervised machine learning and which is a very general method. So that means these methods can be actually applied to any text categorization problem. As long as we have humans to help annotate some training data set and design features, then supervised machine learning and all these uh, classifiers can be easily uh, applied to those uh, problems to solve the categorization problem to allow us to uh, characterize content of text concisely with categories or to predict uh, some properties of uh, real-world variables that are associated with text data. Um, the computers, of course, uh, here are trying to optimize the combinations of the features uh, provided by human. And as I said, there are many different ways of combining them and they also optimize different object functions. Uh, but in order to achieve good performance, they all require effective features and also plenty of training data. So as a general rule, and if you can improve the feature representation and, and then provide more training data, then you can generally do better. And so performance is uh, often much more affected by the effectiveness of features and then by the choice of specific classifiers. So feature design uh, tends to be more important than the choice of specific classifier. So how do we design effective features? Well, unfortunately, this is very application specific. So there's no really uh, much general um, thing to say here. Um, but uh, we can uh, do some analysis of the categorization problem and try to understand the, what kind of features might help us distinguish categories. And in general, we can use a lot of domain knowledge to help us uh, this, uh, design features. And another way to uh, figure out the uh, effective features is to do error analysis uh, on the categorization results. And uh, you could, for example, look at the, which category tends to be confused with, what, with which other categories. And you can use a confusing matrix to examine the errors systematically across categories. And then you can look into specific instances to, to see why the mistake has been made and what features can prevent the mistake. And this can allow you to obtain insights for designing new features. So error analysis is very important in general, and that's where you can get the in insights about your specific problem. And, and finally, we can leverage some uh, machine learning techniques. So for example, feature selection is a technique that we haven't really talked about, but it's very important. And it has to do with uh, trying to select the most useful features before you actually train a full classifier. And sometimes training a classifier would also help you identify which features have high values. And there are also other ways to ensure the sparsity uh, of the model, meaning to uh, recognize the weights. So for example, the uh, SVM actually uh, tries to minimize the, the weights on features, but you can further force some uh, features to, uh, force to use only a small number of features. Uh, there are also techniques for dimension um, reduction, and that's to reduce a high dimensional feature space into a low dimensional space, typically by clustering of features uh, in various ways. So, um, so matrix uh, factorization has been used to do such a, a job, and this and some of the techniques are actually very similar to the topic models that we discussed. So, topic models um, like PLSA or LDA can actually help us reduce the dimension of features. Right? Imagine the words are original um, feature representation. Uh, 
but the representation can be mapped to the topic space representation. Let's say we have k topics, so a document can now be represented as a vector of just k values corresponding to the topics. So we can let each topic define one dimension, so we have k dimensional space instead of the original high dimensional space corresponding to words. And this is often another way to learn effective features. Especially, we could also uh, use the categories to supervise learning of such low dimensional structures. And, and so the original word features can be also combined with such, uh, such latent dimension features or low dimensional uh, space features to provide a multi resolution representation, which is often very useful. Deep learning is a new technique that has been developed uh, in machine learning. Uh, it, it's particularly used for, for learning representations. So deep learning refers to deep neural network. It's another kind of classifier where you can um, have uh, intermediate features embedded in the, in the model so that it's a, a highly nonlinear uh, classifier. And some recent advance has allowed us to train such a complex network uh, effectively. And it, the technique has been shown to be quite effective uh, for speech recognition, computer vision, and recently it has been applied to text as well. Uh, it has shown some promise. And one important advantage of this approach uh, in uh, relationship uh, with the feature design is that they can learn intermediate representations or compound features uh, automatically. And this is very valuable for um, learning uh, effective representation for text categorization. Although in text domain, because words are excellent representation of text content, because these are uh, humans' invention for communication, and they are generally sufficient for, um, for representing content for many tasks. Uh, if there's a need for some new representation, people would have invented a new word. A new word. So because of this reason, the value of deep learning for text um, processing uh, tends to be lower than uh, for computer vision and the speech recognition, where there aren't uh, corresponding uh, well designed uh, words uh, as features. Um, but deep learning is still very promising for learning effective features, especially for complicated tasks like a sentiment analysis and has been shown to be effective um, because it can provide representation that goes beyond bag of words. Now, regarding the training examples, it's generally hard to get a lot of training examples because it involves human labor. Uh, but there are also some ways to, to help with this. So one is to assume some uh, low quality training examples can also be used. So those can be called pseudo training examples. For example, uh, if you take uh, reviews uh, from the internet, they might have overall ratings. So to train a sentiment categorizer, uh, meaning we want to distinguish positive from negative opinions and categorize reviews into these two categories, then um, we could assume five star reviews are all positive training examples, one star are negative. But of course, sometimes in five star reviews, we also mention negative opinions. So the training example is not all of that high quality, but they can still be useful. Another idea is to exploit the unlabeled data, and there are techniques uh, called semi-supervised machine learning techniques that can allow you to combine labeled data with unlabeled data. So in our case, actually, it's easy to see the mixture model can be used for both text clustering and categorization. So you can imagine if you have a lot of unlabeled text data for categorization, then you can actually uh, do clustering on these text data learn categories, and then try to somehow align these categories with the categories uh, defined by the training data, where we already know which documents are in which category. So you can, in fact, use the EM algorithm to actually combine both. That would allow you essentially to also pick up useful words in the unlabeled data. You can think of this in another way. Basically, we can use, uh, let's say, a naive base classifier to classify all the um, the unlabeled text documents. And then we're going to assume the high confidence uh, classification results are actually reliable. 
then you certainly have more training data because uh, from the unlabeled data, we now know some are labeled as category one, some are labeled as category two. Although the labeling is not uh, completely reliable, but then they can still be useful. So let's assume they are actually um, uh, training uh, labeled examples, and then we can combine them with the true training examples to improve uh, categorization method. And so this idea is very powerful. And when the enabled data and the training data are very different, and we might need to use other advanced machine learning techniques um, called domain adaptation or transfer learning. This is uh, when we can borrow some training examples from a related problem that may be different, or from a categorization task that, uh, that involves data that follow very different distributions from what we are working on. But basically, when the two domains are very different, then we need to be careful not to overfit the training domain. But yet, we can still want to use some signals from the related training data. So for example, uh, training categorization on news uh, might not uh, give you uh, immediately uh, effective classify for classifying topics in tweets. But um, you can um, still learn something from news uh, to help uh, categorizing uh, tweets. So uh, there are machine learning techniques that can help you uh, do that effectively. Here's a suggested reading and where you can uh, find more details about some of the methods that we have covered. Thank you.